Thought Vibration, or The Law of Attraction in the Thought World, by William Walker Atkinson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Algie Pug. Thought Vibration, or The Law of Attraction in the Thought World, Part 1, Chapters 1 to 4. Chapter 1. The Law of Attraction in the Thought World The universe is governed by law, one great law. Its manifestations are multiform, but viewed from the ultimate there is but one law. We are familiar with some of its manifestations, but are almost totally ignorant of certain others. Still, we are learning a little more every day. The veil is being gradually lifted. We speak learnedly of the law of gravitation, but ignore that equally wonderful manifestation, the law of attraction in the thought world. We are familiar with that wonderful manifestation of law which draws and holds together the atoms of which matter is composed. We recognize the power of the law that attracts bodies to the earth, that holds the circling worlds in their places, but we close our eyes to the mighty law that draws to us the things we desire or fear that makes or mars our lives. When we come to see that thought is a force, a manifestation of energy, having a magnet-like power of attraction, we will begin to understand the why and wherefore of many things that have heretofore seemed dark to us. There is no study that will so well repay the student for his time and trouble as the study of the workings of this mighty law of the world of thought, the law of attraction. When we think, we send out vibrations of a fine ethereal substance, which are as real as the vibrations manifesting light, heat, electricity, magnetism. That these vibrations are not evident to our five senses is no proof that they do not exist. A powerful magnet will send out vibrations and exert a force sufficient to attract to itself a piece of steel weighing a hundred pounds, but we can neither see, taste, smell, hear, nor feel the mighty force. These thought vibrations, likewise, cannot be seen, tasted, smelled, heard or felt in the ordinary way, although it is true there are on record cases of persons peculiarly sensitive to psychic impressions who have perceived powerful thought waves, and very many of us can testify that we have distinctly felt the thought vibrations of others, both whilst in the presence of the sender and at a distance. Telepathy and its kindred phenomena are not idle dreams. Light and heat are manifested by vibrations of a far lower intensity than those of thought, but the difference is solely in the rate of vibration. The annals of science throw an interesting light upon this question. Professor Elisha Gray, an eminent scientist, says in his little book, The Miracles of Nature, There is much food for speculation in the thought that there exist sound waves that no human ear can hear, and color waves of light that no eye can see. The long, dark, soundless space between 40,000 and 400,000 billion vibrations per second and the infinity of range beyond 700,000 billion vibrations per second, where light ceases in the universe of motion, makes it possible to indulge in speculation. M. M. Williams, in his work entitled Short Chapters in Science, says, There is no gradation between the most rapid undulations or tremblings that produce our sensation of sound, and the slowest of those which give rise to our sensations of gentlest warmth. There is a huge gap between them, wide enough to include another world of motion, all lying between our world of sound and our world of heat and light, and there is no good reason whatever for supposing that matter is incapable of such intermediate activity, or that such activity may not give rise to intermediate sensations, provided there are organs for taking up and sensifying their movements. I cite the above authorities, merely to give you food for thought, not to attempt to demonstrate to you the fact that thought vibrations exist. The last named fact has been fully established to the satisfaction of numerous investigators of the subject, 
and a little reflection will show you that it coincides with your own experiences. We often hear repeated the well-known mental science statement, Thoughts are things, and we say these words over without consciously realizing just what is the meaning of the statement. If we fully comprehended the truth of the statement and the natural consequences of the truth back of it, we should understand many things that have appeared dark to us and would be able to use the wonderful power thought force just as we use any other manifestation of energy as i have said when we think we set into motion vibrations of a very high degree but just as real as the vibrations of light heat sound electricity and when we understand the laws governing the production and transmission of these vibrations we will be able to use them in our daily life just as we do the better known forms of energy that we cannot see hear weigh or measure these vibrations is no proof that they do not exist there exist waves of sound which no human ear can hear although some of these are undoubtedly registered by the ear of some of the insects and others are caught by delicate scientific instruments invented by man yet there is a great gap between the sounds registered by the most delicate instrument and the limit which man's mind reasoning by analogy knows to be the boundary line between sound waves and some other forms of vibration and there are light waves which the eye of man does not register some of which may be detected by more delicate instruments and many more so fine that the instrument has not yet been invented which will detect them although improvements are being made every year and the unexplored field gradually lessened as new instruments are invented new vibrations are registered by them and yet the vibrations were just as real before the invention of the instrument as afterward supposing that we had no instruments to register magnetism one might be justified in denying the existence of that mighty force because it could not be tasted felt smelt heard seen weighed or measured and yet the mighty magnet would still send out waves of force sufficient to draw to it pieces of steel weighing hundreds of pounds. Each form of vibration requires its own form of instrument for registration. At present, the human brain seems to be the only instrument capable of registering thought waves, although occultists say that in this century scientists will invent apparatus sufficiently delicate to catch and register such impressions, and from present indications, it looks as if the invention named might be expected at any time. The demand exists, and undoubtedly will be soon supplied. But to those who have experimented along the lines of practical telepathy, no further proof is required than the results of their own experiments. We are sending out thoughts of greater or less intensity all the time, and we are reaping the results of such thoughts. Not only do our thought waves influence ourselves and others, but they have a drawing power. They attract to us the thoughts of others, things, circumstances, people, luck, in accord with the character of the thought uppermost in our minds. Thoughts of love will attract to us the love of others, circumstances and surroundings in accord with the thought, people who are of like thought. Thoughts of anger, hate, envy, malice and jealousy will draw to us the foul brood of kindred thoughts emanating from the minds of others, circumstances in which we will be called upon to manifest those vile thoughts, and will receive them in turn from others, people who will manifest in harmony, and so on. A strong thought, or a thought long continued, will make us the centre of attraction for the corresponding thought waves of others. Like attracts like in the thought world. As ye sow, so shall ye reap. Birds of a feather flock together in the thought world. Curses like chickens come home to roost, and bringing their friends with them. The man or woman who is filled with love sees love on all sides, and attracts the love of others. The man with hate in his heart gets all the hate he can stand. The man who thinks fight generally runs up against all the fight he wants before he gets through. And so it goes. Each gets what he calls for over the wireless telegraphy of the mind. The man who rises in the morning feeling grumpy usually manages to have the whole family in the same mood before the breakfast is over. 
the nagging woman generally finds enough to satisfy her nagging propensity during the day. This matter of thought attraction is a serious one. When you stop to think of it, you will see that a man really makes his own surroundings, although he blames others for it. I have known people who understood this law to hold a positive, calm thought, and be absolutely unaffected by the inharmony surrounding them. They were like the vessel from which the oil had been poured on the troubled waters. They rested safely and calmly while the tempest raged around them. One is not at the mercy of the fitful storms of thought after he has learned the workings of the law. We have passed through the age of physical force on to the age of intellectual supremacy, and are now entering a new and almost unknown field, that of psychic power. This field of energy has its established laws, as well as have the others, and we should acquaint ourselves with them, or we will be crowded to the wall, as are the ignorant, on the planes of effort. I will endeavour to make plain to you the great underlying principles of this new field of energy, which is opening up before us, that you may be able to make use of this great power, and apply it for legitimate and worthy purposes just as men are using steam, electricity, and other forms of energy today. Chapter 2. Thought Waves and Their Process of Reproduction Like a stone thrown into the water, thought produces ripples and waves which spread out over the great ocean of thought. There is this difference, however. The waves on the water move only on a level plane in all directions whereas thought waves move in all directions from a common centre, just as do the rays from the sun. Just as we here on earth are surrounded by a great sea of air, so are we surrounded by a great sea of mind. Our thought waves move through this vast mental ether, extending, however, in all directions as I have explained, becoming somewhat lessened in intensity according to the distance traversed, because of the friction occasioned by the waves coming in contact with the great body of mind surrounding us on all sides. These thought waves have other qualities differing from the waves on the water. They have the property of reproducing themselves. In this respect they resemble sound waves rather than waves upon the water. Just as a note of the violin will cause the thin glass to vibrate and sing, so will a strong thought tend to awaken similar vibrations in minds attuned to receive it. Many of the stray thoughts which come to us are but reflections or answering vibrations to some strong thought sent out by another. But unless our minds are attuned to receive it, the thought will not likely affect us. If we are thinking high and great thoughts, our minds acquire a certain keynote corresponding to the character of the thoughts we have been thinking and this keynote once established we will be apt to catch the vibrations of other minds keyed to the same thought on the other hand let us get into the habit of thinking thoughts of an opposite character and we will be soon be echoing the low order of thought emanating from the minds of the thousands thinking along the same lines we are largely what we have thought ourselves into being the balance being represented by the character of the suggestions and thoughts of others which have reached us either directly by verbal suggestions or telepathically by means of such thought waves. Our general mental attitude, however, determines the character of the thought waves received from others, as well as the thoughts emanating from ourselves. We receive only such thoughts as are in harmony with the general mental attitude held by ourselves. The thoughts, not in harmony, affecting us very little, as they awaken no response in us. The man who believes thoroughly in himself, and maintains a positive, strong, mental attitude of confidence and determination, is not likely to be affected by the adverse and negative thoughts of discouragement and failure emanating from the minds of other persons in whom these last qualities predominate. At the same time, these negative thoughts, if they reach one whose mental attitude is pitched on a low key, deepen his negative state and add fuel to the fire which is consuming his strength, or, if he prefer this figure, serve to further smother the fire of his energy and activity. We attract to ourselves the thoughts of others of the same order of thought. The man who thinks success will be apt to get into tune with the minds of others thinking likewise 
and they will help him, and he them. The man who allows his mind to dwell constantly upon thoughts of failure brings himself into close touch with the minds of other failure people, and each will tend to pull the other down still more. The man who thinks that all is evil is apt to see much evil, and will be brought into contact with others who will seem to prove his theory. And the man who looks for good in everything and everybody will be likely to attract to himself the things and people corresponding to his thought. We we'll generally see that for which we look. You will be able to carry this idea more clearly if you will think of the Marconi wireless instruments which receive the vibrations only from the sending instrument which has been attuned to the same key, while other telegrams are passing through the air in near vicinity without affecting the instrument. The same law applies to the operations of thought. We receive only that which corresponds to our mental attunement. If we have been discouraged, we may rest assured that we have dropped into a negative key, and have been affected not only by our own thoughts, but have also received the added depressing thoughts of similar character which are constantly being sent out from the minds of other unfortunates who have not yet learned the law of attraction in the thought world. And if we occasionally rise to heights of enthusiasm and energy, how quickly we feel the inflow of the courageous, daring, energetic, positive thoughts being sent out by the live men and women of the world. We recognize this without much trouble when we come into personal contact with people and feel their vibrations, depressing or invigorating as the case may be. But the same law operates when we are not in their presence, although less strongly. The mind has many degrees of pitch, ranging from the highest positive note to the lowest negative note, with many notes in between, varying in pitch according to their respective distance from the positive or negative extreme. When your mind is operating along positive lines, you feel strong, buoyant, bright, cheerful, happy, confident and courageous, and are enabled to do your work well, to carry out your intentions, and progress on your roads to success. You send out strong positive thought, which affects others and causes them to cooperate with you or follow your lead, according to their own mental keynote. When you are playing on the extreme negative end of the mental keyboard, you feel depressed, weak, passive, dull, fearful, cowardly, and you find yourself unable to make progress or to succeed, and your effect upon others is practically nil. You are led by, rather than leading others, and are used as a human doormat or football by more positive persons. In some persons the positive element seems to predominate, and in others the negative quality seems to be more in evidence. There are, of course, widely varying degrees of positiveness and negativeness, and B may be negative to A, while positive to C. When two people first meet, there is generally a silent mental conflict in which their respective minds test their quality of positiveness and fix their relative position towards each other. This process may be unconscious in many cases, but it occurs nevertheless. The adjustment is often automatic, but occasionally the struggle is so sharp, the opponents being so well matched, that the matter forces itself into the consciousness of the two people. Sometimes both parties are so much alike in their degrees of positiveness that they fail to come to terms mentally. They never really are able to get along with each other, and they are either mutually repelled and separate, or else stay together amid constant broils and wrangling. We are positive or negative to everyone with whom we have relations. We may be positive to our children, our employees and dependents, but we are at the same time negative to others to whom we occupy inferior positions, or whom we have allowed to assert themselves over us. Of course, something may occur, and we will suddenly become more positive than the man or woman to whom we have heretofore been negative. We frequently see cases of this kind, and as the knowledge of these mental laws becomes more general, we will see many more instances of persons asserting themselves and making use of their new-found power. But remember, you possess the power to raise the keynote of your mind to a positive pitch by an effort of the will, and, of course, it is equally true that you may allow yourself to drop into a low negative note by carelessness or a weak will. There are more people on the negative plane of thought than on the positive plane, 
and consequently there are more negative thought vibrations in operation in our mental atmosphere. But happily for us, this is counterbalanced by the fact that a positive thought is infinitely more powerful than a negative one, and if by force of will we raise ourselves to a high mental key, we can shut out the depressing thoughts and may take up the vibrations corresponding with our changed mental attitude. This is one of the secrets of the affirmations and auto-suggestions used by the several schools of mental science and other new thought cults. There is no particular merit in affirmations of themselves, but they serve a twofold purpose. One, they tend to establish new mental attitudes within us and act wonderfully in the direction of character building, the science of making ourselves over. Two, they tend to raise the mental keynote so that we may get the benefit of the positive thought ways of others on the same plane of thought. Whether or not we believe in them, we are constantly making affirmations. The man who asserts that he can and will do a thing, and asserts it earnestly, develops in himself the qualities conducive to the well-doing of that thing, and at the same time places his mind in the proper key to receive all the thought waves likely to help him in the doing. If, on the other hand, one says and feels that he is going to fail, he will choke and smother the thoughts coming from his own subconscious mentality which are intended to help him, and at the same time will place himself in tune with the failure thought of the world, and there is plenty of the latter kind of thought around, I can tell you. Do not allow yourself to be affected by the adverse and negative thoughts of those around you. Rise to the upper chambers of your mental dwelling and key yourself up to a strong pitch, away above the vibrations of the lower planes of thought. Then you will not only be immune to their negative vibrations, but will be in touch with the great body of strong positive thought coming from those of your own plane of development. My aim will be to direct and train you in the proper use of thought and will, so that you may have yourself well in hand, and may be able to strike the positive key at any moment you may feel it necessary. It is not necessary to strike the extreme note on all occasions. The better plan is to keep yourself in a comfortable key, without much strain, and to have the means at command whereby you can raise the pitch at once when occasion demands. By this knowledge you will not be at the mercy of the old automatic action of the mind, but may have it well under your own control. Development of the will is very much like the development of a muscle a matter of practice and gradual improvement. At first it is apt to be tiresome, but at each trial one goes stronger until a new strength becomes real and permanent. Many of us have made ourselves positive under sudden calls or emergencies. We are in the habit of bracing up when occasion demands, but by intelligent practice you will be so much strengthened that your habitual state will be equal to your bracing up stage now and then, when you feel it necessary to apply the spur, you will be able to reach a stage not dreamed of at present. Do not understand me as advocating a high tension continuously. This is not at all desirable, not only because it is apt to be too much of a strain upon you, but also because you will find it desirable to relieve the tension at times, and become receptive that you may absorb impressions. It is well to be able to relax and assume a certain degree of receptiveness, knowing that you are always able to spring back to the more positive state at will. The habitually strong positive man loses much enjoyment and recreation. Positive, you give out expressions. Receptive, you take in impressions. Positive, you are a teacher. Receptive, a pupil. It is not only a good thing to be a good teacher, but it is also very important to be a good listener at times. Chapter 3. A Talk About the Mind Man has but one mind, but he has many mental faculties, each faculty being capable of functioning along two different lines of mental effort. There are no distinct dividing lines separating the two several functions of a faculty, but they shade into each other as do the colours of the spectrum. An active effort of any faculty of the mind is the result of a direct impulse imparted at the time of the effort. A passive effort of any faculty of the mind is a result of either a preceding active effort of the same mind, an active effort of another along the lines of suggestion, thought vibrations from the mind of another, 
thought impulses from an ancestor transmitted by the law of heredity including impulses transmitted from generation to generation from the time of the original vibratory impulse imparted by the primal cause which impulses gradually unfold and unsheath when the proper state of evolutionary development is reached the active effort is new-born fresh from the mint whilst the passive effort is of less recent creation and in fact is often the result of vibratory impulses imparted in ages long past the active effort makes its own way brushing aside the impeding vines and kicking from its path the obstructing stones the passive effort travels along the beaten path a thought impulse or motion impulse originally caused by an active effort of faculty may become by continued repetition or habit strictly automatic the impulse given it by the repeated active effort developing a strong momentum which carries it along passive lines until stopped by another active effort or its direction changed by the same cause on the other hand thought impulses or motion impulses continued along passive lines may be terminated or corrected by an active effort the active function creates changes or destroys the passive function carries on the work given it by the active function and obeys orders and suggestions the active function produces the thought habit or motion habit and imparts to it the vibrations which carry it along the passive lines thereafter the active function also has the power to send forth vibrations which neutralize the momentum of the thought habit or motion habit it also is able to launch a new thought habit or motion habit with stronger vibrations which overcomes and absorbs the first thought or motion and substitutes the new one all thought impulses or motion impulses once started on their errands continue to vibrate along passive lines until corrected or terminated by subsequent impulses imparted by the active function or other controlling power the continuance of the original impulse adds momentum and force to it and renders its correction or termination more difficult this explains that which is called the force of habit i think that this will be readily understood by those who have struggled to overcome a habit which has been easily acquired the law applies to good habits as well as bad the moral is obvious several of the faculties of the mind often combine to produce a single manifestation a task to be performed may call for the combined exercise of several faculties some of which may manifest by active effort and others by passive effort the meeting of new conditions new problems calls for the exercise of active effort whilst the familiar problem or task can be easily handled by the passive effort without the assistance of his more enterprising brother there is in nature an instinctive tendency of living organisms to perform certain actions the tendency of an organized body to seek that which satisfies the wants of its organism this tendency is sometimes called appetency it is really a passive mental impulse originating with the impetus imparted by the primal cause and transmitted along the lines of evolutionary development gaining strength and power as it progresses the impulse of the primal cause is assisted by the powerful upward attraction exerted by the absolute in plant life this tendency is plainly discernible ranging from the lesser exhibitions in the lower types to the greater in the higher types it is that which is generally spoken of as the life force in plants it is however a manifestation of rudimentary mentation functioning along the lines of passive effort in some of the higher forms of plant life there appears a faint color of independent life action a faint indication of choice or volition writers on plant life relate many remarkable instances of this phenomenon it is undoubtedly an exhibition of rudimentary active mentation in the lower animal kingdom a very high degree of passive mental effort is found and varying degree in the several families and species a considerable amount of active mentation is apparent the lower animal undoubtedly possesses reason only in a lesser degree than man and in fact the display of volitional mentation exhibited by an intelligent animal is often nearly as high as that shown by the lower types of man or by a young child 
as a child before birth shows in its body the stages of the physical evolution of man so does a child before and after birth until maturity manifest the stages of the mental evolution of man man the highest type of life yet produced at least upon this planet shows the highest form of passive mentation and also a much higher development of active mentation than is seen in the lower animals and yet the degrees of that power vary widely among the different races of men even among men of our race the different degrees of active mentation are plainly noticeable these degrees not depending by any means upon the amount of culture social position or educational advantages possessed by the individual mental culture and mental development are two very different things you have but to look around you to see the different stages of the development of active mentation in man the reasoning of many men is scarcely more than passive mentation exhibiting but little of the qualities of volitional thought they prefer to let other men think for them active mentation tires them and they find the instinctive automatic passive mental process much easier their minds work along the lines of least resistance they are but little more than human sheep among the lower animals and the lower types of men active mentation is largely confined to the grosser faculties the more material plane the higher mental faculties working along the instinctive automatic lines of the passive function as the lower forms of life progressed in the evolutionary scale they developed new faculties which were latent within them these faculties always manifested in the form of rudimentary passive functioning and afterwards worked up through higher passive forms until the active functions were brought into play the evolutionary process still continues the invariable tendency being toward the goal of highly developed active mentation this evolutionary progress is caused by the vibratory impulse imparted by the primal cause aided by the uplifting attraction of the absolute this law of evolution is still in progress and man is beginning to develop new powers of mind which of course are first manifesting themselves along the lines of passive effort some men have developed these new faculties to a considerable degree and it is possible that before long man will be able to exercise them along the line of their active functions in fact this power has already been attained by a few this is the secret of the oriental occultists and of some of their occidental brethren the amenability of the mind to the will can be increased by properly directed practice that which we are in the habit of referring to as the strengthening of the will is in reality the training of the mind to recognize and absorb the power within the will is strong enough it does not need strengthening but the mind needs to be trained to receive and act upon the suggestions of the will the will is the outward manifestation of the i am the will current is flowing in full strength along the spiritual wires but you must learn how to raise the trolley pole to touch it before the mental car will move this is a somewhat different idea from that which you have been in the habit of receiving from writers on the subject of will power but it is correct as you will demonstrate to your satisfaction if you will follow up the subject by experiments along the proper lines the attraction of the absolute is drawing man upward and the vibratory force of the primal impulse has not yet exhausted itself the time of evolutionary development has come when man can help himself the man who understands the law can accomplish wonders by means of the development of the powers of the mind whilst the man who turns his back upon the truth will suffer from his lack of knowledge of the law he who understands the laws of his mental being develops his latent powers and uses them intelligently he does not despise his passive mental functions but makes good use of them also charges them with the duties for which they are best fitted and is able to obtain wonderful results from their work having mastered them and trained them to do the bidding of the higher self when they fail to do their work properly he regulates them and his knowledge prevents him from meddling with them unintelligently and thereby doing himself harm he develops the faculties and powers latent within him and learns how to manifest them along the line of active mentation as well as passive he knows that the real man within him is the master to whom both the active and passive functions are but tools 
He has banished fear and enjoys freedom. He has found himself. He has learned the secret of I am. Chapter 4 Mind Building Man can build up his mind and make it what he wills. In fact, we are mind building every hour of our lives, either consciously or unconsciously. The majority of us are doing the work unconsciously, but those who have seen a little below the surface of things have taken the matter in hand and have become conscious creators of their own mentality. They are no longer subject to the suggestions and influences of others, but have become masters of themselves. They assert the I and compel obedience from the subordinate mental faculties. The I is the sovereign of the mind, and what we call will is the instrument of the I. Of course, there is something back of this, and the universal will is higher than the will of the individual, but the latter is in much closer touch with the universal will than is generally supposed, and when one conquers the lower self and asserts the I, he becomes in close touch with the universal will and partakes largely of its wonderful power. The moment one asserts the I and finds himself, he establishes a close connection between the individual will and the universal will. But before he is able to avail himself of the mighty power at his command, he must first affect the mastery of the lower self. Think of the absurdity of man claiming to manifest powers when he is the slave of the lower parts of his mental being which should be subordinate. Think of a man being the slave of his moods, passions, animal appetites and lower faculties, and at the same time trying to claim the benefits of the will. Now I am not preaching asceticism, which seems to me to be a confession of weakness. I am speaking of self-mastery, the assertion of the I over the subordinate parts of oneself. In the high view of the subject, this I is the only real self and the rest is the non-self. But our space does not permit the discussion of this point, and we will use the word self as meaning the entire man. Before a man can assert the I in its full strength, he must obtain the complete mastery of the subordinate parts of the self. All things are good when we learn to master them, but no thing is good when it masters us. Just so long as we allow the lower portions of the self to give us orders, we are slaves. It is only when the eye mounts his throne and lifts the sceptre that order is established and things assume their proper relation to each other. We are finding no fault with those who are swayed by their lower selves. They are in a lower grade of evolution and will work up in time. But we are calling the attention of those who are ready to the fact that the sovereign must assert his will and that the subjects must obey. Orders must be given and carried out. Rebellion must be put down, and the rightful authority insisted upon, and the time to do it is now. You have been allowing your rebellious subjects to keep the king from his throne. You have been allowing the mental kingdom to be misgoverned by irresponsible faculties. You have been the slaves of appetite, unworthy thoughts, passion, and negativeness. The will has been set aside, and low desire has usurped the throne. It is time to re-establish order in the mental kingdom. You are able to assert the mastery over any emotion, appetite, passion, or class of thoughts by the assertion of the will. You can order fear to go to the rear, jealousy to leave your presence, hate to depart from your sight, anger to hide itself, worry to cease troubling you, uncontrolled appetite and passion to bow in submission, and to become humble slaves instead of masters all by the assertion of the I. You may surround yourself with a glorious company of courage, love and self-control by the same means. You may put down the rebellion and secure peace and order in your mental kingdom if you will but utter the mandate and insist upon its execution. Before you march forth to empire, you must establish the proper internal condition, must show your ability to govern your own kingdom. The first battle is the conquest of the lesser self by the real self. Affirmation I am asserting the mastery of my real self. Repeat these words earnestly and positively during the day at least once an hour, and particularly when you are confronted with conditions which tempt you to act on the lines of the lesser self 
instead of following the course dictated by the real self. In the moment of doubt and hesitation, say these words earnestly, and your way will be made clear to you. Repeat them several times after you retire and settle yourself to sleep. But be sure to back up the words with the thoughts inspiring them, and do not merely repeat them parrot-like. Form the mental image of the real self asserting its mastery over the lower planes of your mind. See the king on his throne. You will become conscious of an influx of new thought, and things which have seemed hard for you will suddenly become much easier. You will feel that you have yourself well in hand, and that you are the master and not the slave. The thought you are holding will manifest itself in action, and you will steadily grow to become that which you have in mind. Exercise Fix the mind firmly on the higher self, and draw inspiration from it when you feel led to yield to the promptings of the lower part of your nature. When you are tempted to burst into anger, assert the I, and your voice will drop. Anger is unworthy of the developed self. When you feel vexed and cross, remember what you are, and rise above your feeling. When you feel fearful, remember that the real self fears nothing, and assert courage. When you feel jealousy inciting, Think of your higher nature and laugh, and so on, asserting the real self and not allowing the things on the lower plane of mentality to disturb you. They are unworthy of you and must be taught to keep their places. Do not allow these things to master you. They should be your subjects, not your masters. You must get away from this plane, and the only way to do so is to cut loose from these phases of thought which have been running things to suit themselves. You may have trouble at the start, but keep at it, and you will have that satisfaction which comes only from conquering the lower parts of our nature. You have been a slave long enough. Now is the time to free yourselves. If you will follow these exercises faithfully, you will be a different being by the end of the year, and will look back with a pitying smile to your former condition. But it takes work. This is not child's play, but a task for earnest men and women. Will you make the effort? End of Thought Vibration or The Law of Attraction in the Thought World Part 1, Chapters 1 to 4 Read by Algie Pug